Hi, everybody. I'm Wendy Murdoch, and this is Webinars with Wendy. This is webinar number 235, I believe. Um, and we're so grateful to have Dr. Joyce Harmon back with us talking about Western saddles. So we'll just dive right in because I know this is a, a, a topic that has a lot to talk about. So welcome, Joyce. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, Wendy, for having me back. And, and uh, this is a great topic because the truth is there's probably more Western, there is more Western riding than there is English. And yet a lot less attention gets paid to the Western saddle. I think a lot of people have a tendency to think, well, it's just, you know, it's a nice big saddle. It's going to be easy on their back. Uh, that doesn't really quite work that way. Um, and so we'll look at saddle fit. How many of you all have have looked or or um, have read much about saddles fit and the way it can cause problems? Is there? Um, I'm just going to put your book in here. Yeah. Um, because the, the whole idea behind saddle fit is that saddle, saddles are key to the way a horse performs, just as your shoes are. And so anybody who has poor fitting shoes, like the shoes that you wear out to dinner or to the, you know, to someplace fancy, what usually happens to your feet before the night is over? It hurts you get grumpy and you want to go home and go to bed, right? So, so you slip your shoes off underneath the table until you, you have to put them off. back on. Yes, yes. And the putting them back on or even worse, go to Equine Affair or Equitana or one of those things with bad fitting shoes and you walk around on concrete all day and you're kind of crippled by the end of the day and you'd have a tendency to get really grumpy when you're crippled. Most of us do. Very few of us get really happy and pleasant. No. So what happens to your horse when the equivalent thing happens to them? They get grumpy. And one of the ways that they learn to be grumpy is to dump us on the ground when we don't listen. So many, many, many aspects of performance or what we consider behavior problems, we consider performance problems, all stem from pain. Now, not 100% of pain is saddle fit, but a, a very high percentage of pain is saddle fit. And saddle fit changes the way that they move. And once the saddle fit changes the way they move, we have a pussycat helping out. Um, so once the saddle fit changes the way they move, then the next thing you know is you do have sore feet or you have a sore back or you end up with hock problems or you end up with um, you end up with other issues that you go and address, but you still haven't gotten back to the core issue. So some of the things that I'm just going to screen share for a moment here. I think you should be able to. Yeah. Just have to find the right thing to share. Ah, yeah. <laughs> um, so if we look at saddles, they're kind of, they're, they're a necessary evil that we, we really need them. There are many sports we cannot do without a saddle. Um, there are other sports we could potentially do without a saddle, but really a lot of the time for a combination of our safety and our ability to get into position that we need, we need a saddle. But we also, it's the only way we communicate with the horse. So if we give a signal, unless we're riding bareback, that signal has to travel through the saddle. So if the signal travels through the saddle and is accompanied by pain, then the information that the horse gets is pain, is that that information that you're trying to give me is painful and I'm not sure that I really wanna to listen to it. So when we start to look at some of the things that can give us poor performance, there's, there's an extensive list of things that can be poor performance from saddle fit or, or from some form of pain. Any horse that tells you that, that gets grumpy when you bring the saddle to them, it is because the saddle is making them uncomfortable. 
And they can see a bad saddle from around the corner, down the aisle, just like you can see a saddle coming to you and you know what it is. You know it's your friend's saddle, not yours. The horses are the same way. Horses in a lot of discomfort, they don't move in the field much or they move excessively. Some of them will try to loosen themselves up and they're, they're crazy in the field. They can be slow to warm up, leave, slow to leave the starting gate. And that the starting gate can be racing, but that starting gate can be a barrel, a barrel class as well. Um, resistant to work. We, we attribute that so often to bad behavior and it's not those horses there are there are a handful of horses out there who are bad they don't want to work they don't want to do they don't want to be a partner with humans the vast majority of horses if they are at all reasonable in life they usually are happy to go to work and they're usually friendly um, or not not necessarily friendly but they're they're perfectly happy and many of them want to go to work that's what they are here to, to do. Horses that are difficult to collect, depending on what your sport is, difficult to maintain your impulsion, whatever words that you want to use. Um, horses that don't concentrate on the rider or their aids. What happens when you have a headache and you're trying to do your taxes? No, let's you, not go there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> not to go there. So, if you have a headache and you're trying to do your taxes, every sound that your cat makes, that your significant other makes opening the refrigerator, that your, that your phone pings, it's like you'll do anything but do your taxes because you're, really the issue is your head hurts. But if you have a headache and you're out on a beautiful trail ride, you'd kind of forget about that headache. So when a horse is getting pain constantly into them, into their back while you're riding, they are not focused. They are like you doing taxes. They are looking for the boogeyman in the bushes. They're spooking. They're not responding because they're busy thinking about the discomfort. They can rush their jumps or fences uphill, downhill. You find yourself using all kinds of devices to make them use their back, use their hindquarters, horses that swish their tails, pin their ears, grind their teeth, all of these behaviors. A lot of the horses that run away that we think of as bad behavior or run away or crazy horses, there are some that are mentally crazy and there are some that are too strong for us as an individual. We may not be a strong enough rider and they may be running away because they can and they sort of feel like it and we can't stop them. But the horses that are dedicated in these bad behaviors, very often it is centered around pain. Most horses don't have that bad attitude. There are crotchety old horses, just like they're crotchety old people and that's who they are. They aren't necessarily the friendliest horses, but they don't have this so totally sour attitude about humans and what we want them to do. We need training aids. They're hard to shoe because their back hurts. They're, they're shying excessively. A lot of them are very sensitive to being brushed or touched because it hurts. So, so those are some of the things that we have to think about when we're deciding, do we have a saddle fitting problem? Is our horse trying to tell us something? So if we, if we start to then think about looking at our horse and looking at our horse's back, um, so we can not, also... I guess it's okay, you're not in play mode, but so we're seeing your slides on the side, but it's, it's fine, they're still readable. Okay, is, are they still big enough? Because I'm yeah. going to skip around a little bit. We're not going to go slide by slide necessarily. Yeah, no, I think it's, it's, if anybody has a problem reading it, we can make it full screen, but just let us know. Because I just realized you were in, in um, edit mode. Okay, yeah. Um, I can make these a little smaller on the side. So a couple of things that you can look at on your horse's back are white spots, white hairs, dark spots, 
dry areas, swellings that come up after saddle fitting. I mean, after you've been riding, um, sometimes your white hairs will go away when the horse sheds, which means the pressure isn't too great. Sometimes you, you purchase a horse that has white hairs and that's may not have anything to do with your saddle or you have replaced your saddle and it's no longer a problem, but you have white hairs left over and that's from a damage to the hair follicle. You'll also see a lot of atrophy of the back muscle of all different types. And sometimes you really see kind of the imprint of a saddle in the horse's muscle. So stand back and look at your horse, stand back and decide whether their back looks healthy and strong and round and muscular. So if we think about now some of the things that we're going to be looking at, thinking about as we look at the, um, at the saddle, there are some things that are different about Western saddles than English. But the truth is that fitting a saddle is fitting a saddle. And I, I don't have the picture on my computer, but years ago, I took a picture of a Western tree and an English panel. It was a foam panel so that it could stand up by itself and laid them on top of each other. And guess what? They're basically almost identical because the horse's back is the horse's back, whether it's a Western horse, an English horse, an Italian horse, a um, pony, it's still the shape of a horse's back and doesn't matter if it's big or small. And actually some of the smallest of ponies are wider than the biggest of draft horses. So saddle fit is to make that saddle comfortable for the horse. And then the trappings that you're gonna put on top are really for the human. Just as with your shoe, you can have a fancy shoe with a pointy toe or something like that, but it still has to fit the structure of your shoe, of your foot. So you can have a bow on the top for a fancy dance shoe. You can have fancy leather. You can put a horn on the front of it. it I don't care what you put on top of the saddle. The, its saddle still has to fit the horse on the bottom and it has to fit the rider on the top because guess what? The rider counts. <laughs> and if you're watching this and hanging out with Wendy, you know that the rider is really important. And if the rider is fighting the saddle the whole time, then the rider becomes a problem. You can have the best fitting saddle on the horse in the world, but if you're fighting that saddle with every step, you can't have a productive lesson because you're spending your whole lesson learning how to put your foot back underneath you when it's impossible because the saddle won't let you. So we're fitting two dynamic structures, a horse that moves and a human that moves and wants to do things. So if you want to go and jump jumps, you probably don't wanna be in this lecture because you will not want a horn on the front of your saddle. If you want to go rope cows, this is a good place to be and the English saddle will not do you a whole lot of good because you've got no horn. Other than those two extremes, saddles are very interchangeable and they have to allow you to balance and do your job as a human and let the horse do his, his or her job. So the, the type of riding that you're doing Western is very similar to dressage, to trail riding, to Western riding, to balanced riding, to whatever type of riding it is that you wanna do other than jumping. So you may adjust your stirrups a little bit differently for a certain horse or a certain type of sport, but basically balanced riding is balanced riding. And the only thing I wanna mention here is that now that um, Western dressage has become popular, some of these Western saddles have a horn, but are not designed to have a cow attached to it. 
Oh yeah. And there are actually many, many of the saddles. If you attach a cow to the front of a barrel racing saddle, it's, it's going to come unglued. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so if you're working uh, with cattle, <laughs> you need to have a, a roping rigid. saddle, this is a proper roping saddle. Yeah. <laughs> um, and yes, mo for many, many saddles, the, the style of the horn and we'll, well, and people were mentioning some of the different saddles they have. Many of those saddles are actually named for the style of the fork and the horn, and it has no relevance to the fit of the saddle underneath. And truthfully, if you're roping, you need a roping saddle. Other than that, I don't care what shape your horn is. I don't care if you have blue leather on it or purple leather. I don't care if you have a silver silver horn on the top. That is not going to affect your fit or the horse's fit. The decorations, the $10,000 silver saddle, whatever, that's all decoration. That's not the fit. So many, many people call the saddle after their own name, and it doesn't have much to do with the design. It may have a little bit to do with the shape of the fork down on the sides that might give you a little bit of support for your thigh as you're say going around a barrel and you don't want to slide forward, but it is not going to affect the style of your riding. The cantle can be the same way. You can have fancy stuff on the cantle, but the cantle has a lot more effect because that is where your buttocks sit. And so depending on the shape of your butt, the shape of the cantle can become very important. The backside of the cantle where the decoration goes, I don't care about that. But where your, where your seat is sitting and where your buttocks are does need to fit your shape. And there's a big difference between a little tiny skinny guy and somebody built like me that is well endowed across that part of her anatomy. So that, that does become a, an important piece. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. You know, I, I think your year in the background is such a great example of structure, which also has function because if you don't have those supports in your yurt, it's not gonna stay up. Well, it's um, like a tent. <laughs> right. Um, but it also, it's that same thing that we have to look at the structure of the saddle, not the decoration of the saddle or the yes. brand name or the, you know. Yep. Yes. And, and so we really, what we really care about is how the saddle fits. So speaking of structure, we will look at a couple of structural details here. And, um, oh, yeah. and here, here's a little bit of the bottom of a Western saddle and the bottom of an English saddle. And this is our Western tree. Oops. Yeah, because you're in I, edit mode. I can edit. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> don't need to. So we have our Western tree here. And the tree is in the Western saddle. The tree is even more important in shape than the English saddle. The English saddle has a bunch of padding on the bottom of it that you can adjust and change shape somewhat. The Western saddle is designed to be on the horse's back. And these areas in here that are lighter in color is where the stirrup leathers go. So a lot of you have probably not seen the inside of a Western tree, which is why I have this here. And the stirrup leathers go across here. And if you can kind of see here, there's a little bit of an indentation where the leather goes. And that means that the whole bottom that the horse feels will be smooth because the leather of the of the stirrup is quite thick. Can you drag that off. picture bigger yeah. since you're in edit mode? Oh, great, yeah. That better? Yeah. Okay. So yeah, you can, you can see here where the, um, where the leather is going to go for the top of the stirrup. This is where, this is where the leather, it literally loops over the top here. Very strong, um, but we need to keep this smooth. And in for saddles, you will not necessarily find a nice smooth connection here. And when you feel the bottom with the um, sheepskin, you can actually feel where the stirrup 
leather goes. And the horse is going to feel that just like you feel the little tiny pebble in your shoe. And that pebble gets bigger and bigger as the days go by or as the hours go by. Well, and it's not as obvious on the upper bar, but on the lower bar, you can see the angle that the groove is set at, which means it's going to angle that leather forward. Yes. Yep. And, and you can also have a lot of times towards the front, you'll have the, um, you'll have a little bit wider piece of leather coming down for your, to protect your leg. And we'll, we'll see the structure of a saddle here in a bit, but this also can, it can allow this leather to slide forward. And as the leather, the farther forward the leather is, the farther back you end up sitting because the, your feet are, are stuck out in front of you. And I've got some pictures later on. Um, so, so yeah, the only point I wanna make is that when people find that their uh, stirrup keeps swinging forward, a lot of times it's because of the groove in the tree that's been cut into it that the leather set in. So from a riding perspective, the rider wants to get their leg back and that saddle will keep dragging their leg forward because of the angle of that groove. Yes, you can, if you have a saddle maker handy that will actually do this for you. If that's the issue, if, you're, if your saddle leather is sliding forward, whoops, um, you can have them actually add some leather to here to build it up to keep your stirrup leather farther back underneath you. Because a Western saddle is pretty easy to take apart and they can actually add a little shim of leather in here, fill this in and make your stirrup leather stay back here. So, so that's, that's a potential fix. Yeah. Finding somebody who, who can that's do, that. do that, that can be a challenge, but it can be done. So if we want to look a little bit more, we'll look at a structural piece here and put that one out of the way. This is a saddle tree looking at it from the top down and you realize that this is not even. So I'm looking at this dead on, right? Oh, and I okay. Set it up to be, this is symmetrically placed. Is this tree symmetrical? Not any way, not even the horn. Right. The horn is offset, which if you're just riding for fun, this is not a big deal. But if you're going to actually be roping and using this for performance, this is going to affect your performance a little bit because it's going to affect some of the physics of your rope pull from one side to the other. But it is less critical to the horse and it's definitely not critical to the rider. And it's not critical to the horse unless you're actually trying to rope off of it. But if we draw a line here and we look at the angle of this and we look at the angle of that, they're completely different. So, so, so are the bars set on to the fork separately? Yes. The, the fork is made and the cantle is made. The bars are made and then they are attached together. So, so the fork is a separate unit. So in this case, the, it looks like the fork wasn't made symmetrically, which is why the bars are at different angles. Yep. And they can be also set on at a slightly different location. Oh, sure. Yeah. On, on the curve, the, the angle of the, of the fork itself, where it ends underneath here is probably different. The bar itself may not be an absolutely perfect match to the other side. So you could have a bar that was a little bit thicker. You could have a bar that was actually twisted. And that the twisted bars are pretty common. And the way that all of this is held together is they use some glue and, and nails and screws and stuff like that. But then they wrap this whole thing in rawhide and that shrinks it together and makes it very, very strong. There is absolutely 
no way that you can build a straight saddle on this tree. It can't happen. I don't care how good the leather worker is, this tree is crooked and it will destroy whatever horse it's put on. And if you notice it's a brand new tree, there's never been any leather put on it because the person who had this tree knew perfectly well that there was no way he was gonna build a saddle on it. But many people, they get the tree in and they build the saddle. They don't even look at how crooked or straight it is. So do you have tree makers? So if I'm a saddle maker, I'm gonna order a tree from a mm -hmm. tree maker and then it's just gonna come into my shop and I'm just gonna do my job. Mm -hmm. Most of the time. There are a few companies that make, the, you know, they have their own tree makers in shop, but most of the time you're just buying trees from tree maker. How many tree makers, Western tree makers are there in the United States? There are, there's a handful of very big ones. And then there are multitudes of small companies that you may not even, you may not even know names of who it is. So they're, because these are, are made out of wood and they're basically carved or, or put through a machine, it is possible where the English tree makers really have to have a lot of specialized equipment. The Western tree makers, you can make a tree in your shop. You can make a tree out in your garage and make it correctly and put it together and have it be strong. The rawhide is a little bit of a pain in the rear end, but, but it is totally doable in a backyard shop. And so there are people who make these in very small quantities. And there are a few big companies, and, but a lot of our commercial Western saddles are made by one of just a handful of large companies. And so it's made out of wood and it's covered in rawhide, but the type of wood it's made out of, at least with a wood tree, not all Western saddles have a wood tree. Right. Okay, but with a wood treed saddle, as I mm -hmm. understand it, you don't want to buy a Western saddle in Colorado and bring it to the East Coast because if the wood hasn't been treated properly, it'll warp in the humidity. Is that true? Uh, that is probably very true. Um, wood is very moisture. Um, I don't know quite what the right term is, but it is. it does expand and contract. Just think about your drawers. Any of you who live in humid climate in the winter time, when you're running your heat and everything's kind of dry, your drawers of your, your dresser or whatever open and close beautifully. And then you get into the summertime and you get a drawer that you haven't opened for a while and you can't open it because it, the wood has actually swelled up. So you can have some significant problems. You can have issues going from dry to moist and back to dry again. So that's, that's some, definitely something to keep in mind and nobody pays attention. And the truth is that if you buy a used saddle, you won't have any idea where it's been before you had it. Um, so you just have, you have to be careful. So you have to look at the actual structure and this is the pre-purchase exam for your saddles. And for most of us, it's the post-purchase exam. Yeah. Because we already own it. So we'll move these things around so that we can look at them separately and you can see, the, see it large. So stand, the easy way with a Western saddle is to lay it on something flat. You can lay it on the ground. Make sure your ground is flat. You can lay it on, on a floor and you're gonna stand behind it or at the top of it and look straight down. And when you're in this looking straight down view, what you're going to get is a very good view of those angles of those bars. And you can also be looking at the coloring and the wear on the sheepskin. So places where the coloring is lighter have less pressure. And very often it will be accompanied by fluffy sheepskin in these areas and compressed sheepskin in these areas. And that's because of pressure. The typical Western saddle does not have a good shape for the horse's back. It's very straight. 
horses have shape to their back. It's also very long, and we'll look at, look at that idea in more detail later. But we, this is a very common pattern, is to see things look lighter in the middle and darker and the fleece be flatter on the ends because of pressure. And you can also see from one side, you have more darkness, more pressure than you do on the other side. And you start to look in more detail, you see more pressure out here and just a little bit on this side. So by just standing there looking at your fleece, you can read an awful lot about what's going on with this saddle. If you have bought it as a used saddle and it, the, it shows up with crooked marks, the chances are pretty good that that's coming from the saddle itself. But horses and riders, we don't want to admit that we are crooked, um, but horses can be crooked and riders can be crooked. And so in a used saddle that you haven't been riding in very long, it's not as clear a picture as to who caused the problem. But if you look down and you see a difference in the two sides, then you know that it's the saddle that's causing the problem. And then the rider gets forced into following the crookedness of the saddle. So then the rider just adds to the problem. So this is a, one really good view to learn a lot. You can then take and look down the back of it. And again, you're looking for symmetry all the way down. So you're looking at the center line and seeing if both of these sides look the same. Another thing you can read into the seat back here is the wear on the seat bones. And depending on where the person has been sitting, if it's been you in the saddle the whole time, then this is a good representation of you. And if you have a wear hole or a much higher pressure or a smooth area in the suede on one side, it's probably you, but it might be you because the saddle's crooked and it's forcing you to be crooked, or it might be that you are crooked and the saddle is straight. So you have to become a detective and, and really look at things to see what's going on and recognize the age of the saddle. A lot of these Western saddles, they, they do last, they can last forever. We can be riding in saddles that are 20, 30, 40 years old, and they may not um, represent what we are creating in the saddle. So you can see if, if this area on the fork is crooked, by itself, that might not affect your fit, but it's a really good indication that there's maybe some other crooked parts to the saddle. And as we're looking at this saddle, this shape here of the fork varies a lot, depending on what you wanna do, depending on how much you wanna be kind of held in the saddle. On some of the barrel saddles, this may become a little more prominent so that you can stand up into it and have it hold you. Um, but this is what a lot of the saddles get named for, is the shape that that saddle maker or that rider a lot of times liked. So a lot of times the Billy Cook is Billy Cook. That was the style he liked doesn't have anything to do with the fit underneath. So His we're name. basically talking about their, their name for their fork. The name for their fork, but that's not the way it is discussed in, in normal circles. It's like, I have a Billy Cook saddle, therefore it fits my horse because he knows how to make a saddle that fits a horse. No, it's a Billy Cook saddle because of the style of this. And yes, he did like that, but it doesn't tell you a thing about this underneath, about this whole piece of the saddle. The shape of the bars, the angle of the bars, yep. the set of the stirrups, yep. the width, the shoulder angle, none of that, yep. just swells, no swells. <laughs> yeah, tooling, frills. I mean, all this stuff back here around this white stuff, I mean, it's all pretty and, and it's fine. It's not gonna harm anybody. You can make big fancy things out here. You can make big fancy, 
skirts out here. And we'll talk about skirts in a minute. But we're looking for, we're looking for fit and function. So we'll make that one a little smaller. And we will go over here to the front of the saddle. This is all the same saddle? No, these are all different saddles. Okay. I think the front and the back actually are the same. This is definitely a different saddle. Right. Yeah. No, I was thinking the front and the back on the other one. Yeah. I remember those pictures. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> That's a long time ago. <laughs> a long time ago. Yeah. And it hasn't changed. I mean, saddle fitting is saddle fitting. I, I have a lot of quotes in my book from a book that was written in 1876, I believe. And the truths are still the same. We are getting a lot more innovative technology being put into trees, plastics, rubbers, adjustability, flexibility, some of which is good, some of which is not. Because if you have a flex point in that tree, that can also become a pressure point. And so just having something flex is not necessarily the solution to our problem. So here, this is looking at the saddle from the front and you can look at the difference in wear of the two sides. Again, this is set up to be square dead on. And I'm looking at two different pieces of this tree, of this, of this bar underneath here. On this side, I can see a whole bunch of it. It flares out more. And on this side, I don't see it which means that those two bars are set on differently and the leather has worn differently. The fleece has worn differently and this saddle has been used hard. And you have to be a little bit careful sometimes looking at the leather right out here because that's gonna get worn every time they put it on the ground, that can get worn. But if it's worn unevenly, the saddle itself is uneven. Something in that saddle is uneven because if it were sitting on the ground evenly, you would have even wear. So you can really see a ton about saddle. And I'm trying to figure out where the straight line would be. Like the blanket's nice because it's got straight lines. But... Mm -hmm. Well, if you drop, if we drop a plumb line straight down, can you see my cursor? Yep. Drop a plumb line straight down through here. That's your center line. So your horn is offset. Your, this, is a, this is approximately the center of the fork. This is higher up, more, this, is, this piece of leather with the sheepskin is closer to the center line on this, on this side than on this side. And that's just putting that on, even if the tree were even, the leather's put on un unevenly, which is going to make it fit and wear differently and fit on the horse differently. So you can, you can take this saddle, put it up on a stand and walk around it. The nice thing with the Western saddles is that you can also, you can't really do this with the English saddles, you can also take a string and you can measure, put your anchor your string with a piece with a nail or something like that in the center of the back of the cantle. And you can measure where the, the girth attachments are. If the, are they the same on both sides? Many times they're not. You can measure to any location on this on this tree. And if the skirting here isn't perfectly symmetrical, that's not gonna be as much of a problem, but it is going to indicate that there are other structural deficiencies and it may very well shift the way you sit in the saddle because this is the human side. We were looking at the horse's side, but from here you can measure down to your, um, to your billet, and girth attachments that are in the back. You can even get a measurement, see where the um, stirrup leathers are coming in. So you can measure and see if those are in the same place. 
because if that groove in the tree is not in the same place, then your stirrup leathers are going to shift. And again, you can go underneath there and you can put that piece of leather to bring that back into balance if that's your primary problem. But you can use your tools to measure. So basically, because the cantle is rigid part of the tree itself, we can use, we can use that as the anchor for our string to measure the two sides of the saddle. We can, yeah. so, and the conchos actually are functional. Like they're holding the skirts, but they're a functional marker, right? Yes, they're a functional marker. They can be put in slightly offset and not harm the fit. But if they are slightly offset, there's a really good chance there is a lot more that's offset in the saddle. So if this were put on a quarter of an inch farther forward, because this piece of skirting wasn't quite the same, you may not have a bad effect. But that concho goes down into the tree. And so you're go if these two things are uneven, it does create a little bit of an uneven pull on the wood and wood over time can distort. So symmetry is important except for this horn and this if the rest of the saddle is okay. So this being the, the swells. The swells, yes. If this seat is crooked, so you can take your little thing and you can measure down to the sides and see, see if it's going down to the conchos on the same side. But let's say the back of this seat is crooked. That is absolutely going to torque you in the saddle as the rider. So if this cantle is set on a little bit kitty cornered, even a quarter of an inch, that is going to affect your riding significantly and noticeably and you're probably gonna have back pain from it because it's gonna to torque your pelvis just a little bit. And that becomes, A, it's difficult to ride and B, that becomes a source of chronic pain. So anybody that's getting off of their saddle going, oh man, I'm really stiff. You need to be looking at the rider side as well as the horse side. The other thing that we have to do structurally is to check for a broken tree. This is the tree you saw. This is a solid piece. It is not that easy to check for a broken tree. You have to use your body. I don't know, do these pictures show up well enough? Do I need Yeah, them? and they're in your book. Yeah, um, I can make that. Maybe yeah, should... actually, you just a uh, slideshow from current slide. That, yeah. That Oops. Oops. Well, yeah. you can just. Whatever. Stop. Just Go click away. It. Yeah. End show. There's my end show button. Now I can go back to where I was. Right here. Play from current slide. There you go. Now, am I sharing? Uh, not yet. Okay. Screen share. There we go. Yep. Okay. So that should be full size. Oh, yeah. Now. There we go. Yep. That helps. Good. So you need to get your body involved in checking a Western tree for a broken tree. Now, you can't just kind of stand there and push on it. People who are strong can do some of these that are in number four and five, pulling and pushing while the saddle is up on a stand. If you hear a creaking when you're doing that, that is a potential indication that you have a broken tree. The, you don't have a ton of movement unless you have a really badly broken tree. And you can see here is a full grown man putting his knees inside at the base of the, um, at the base of the fork. And you're not going to move that tree, but you're likely to feel a little give or a creak. You'll hear it, that it's making some sounds while you're doing these movements. So 
stand up, put your weight into the back of it. Now, if the very back of the cantle, like, like where his hand is here, if the very back of the cantle is broken along in here, that's not gonna affect anybody. We can't see your pointer, is that number one? Oh, a number five, okay, I wonder why you can't see it. Oh, there, number. it's back, now we can see it. Can you see it now? Uh, no, I just, I just saw it and it disappeared. Just tell us which slide you're talking All right. about. Um, an error, does that work? Uh, I s oh yeah, there it is. Okay, so in, in this number five, I'm just pointing out the area around that's out of the structure, which is leather, this can be decorated, tooled. If something's broken right here under the finger, that's not a big deal. If something is moving up in here, or moving where, oops, moving where the cantle attaches to the bars themselves, you have a problem. Now, some and, of these trees are synthetic now. Are they gonna have more, get, like if you did your knees in between the fork, is that gonna be different on a synthetic? Um, it is going to be different on some of these more flexible trees. And if you get a whole lot of give when you do this, then you need to find out about your tree and what it's made of and what is expected from the amount of movement. Sometimes you just have to take it to a saddle maker and say, take this apart and tell me if the tree is broken. Because if you're suspicious, but you don't know, and the saddle company isn't very helpful, or they can't tell you how much give it's supposed to have, yeah. then these saddles are easy to open up. And so uh, and any, even if they aren't the best saddle maker in the world, if they're good leather workers, they can take a Western saddle apart and put it back together and tell you whether the tree is broken or not. And if the tree is broken, they make great bar stools, yeah. period. Um, they do not belong on the back of a horse. So let me in my show. Yeah, because now we're getting more synthetic resin trees mm -hmm. um, and those lighter trees for the Western dressage. They're not your wood tree like what we saw here. So they're going to be different. They are gonna be different. And what you're going to see is that some of them have some flex. Can you see my um, cursor here? Nope. You've unshared. I unshared? Oh, <laughs> I didn't think I did that. I just thought I ended my show. Uh, when you ended unshares. Oh, okay. So you will have flex in some of these flexible saddles in the middle here. Yep. And the problem with that can be is that you end up with a nice flex point right on the horse's back if there's too much flex. Flex is not always a good thing. And the, the way that people are using technology right now, some of it is really working and some of the, the horses love and some of it is not working. And if you think about looking at the bottom of, well, look at this saddle again. If this bar has a flexible area here, and every time you sit in it or you take a canter stride or a trot stride, it bends right here, what, the, what is the horse going to feel? Narrowing pressure on a smaller surface, increasing pressure on a narrowing surface area. Yep. So if we have give in the saddle, we want some give all the way along. And we, if we have give across the fork, we want give that isn't collapsing the saddle and making it too wide. So if we look at, well, and if the, if the stirrup leathers are going over the flexing part of the tree, you're really putting all of the rider's weight just on the leathers themselves and the rest of the tree is flexing away. Yes. So we will look at another screen share. Not sure. 
If anybody's got any questions, just pop in the chat or the Q&A. You guys have been really quiet on this. So, yeah. <laughs> so you know, it's so funny because sometimes my, my, uh, my guests are really chatty and other times they're, I don't know if they're stunned into silence. <laughs> <laughs> Overloaded. All right. So we are going to have two things to share here. Oh, cool. So here's a drawing so that you can begin to see what this looks like on the horse's back. So if your flex point, because that's what we're kind of talking about here, if your flex point is here and your stirrup leathers are going across right here, then all of that pressure is concentrated in this small area. And that big, huge bar that you see is doing nothing. You're riding in this small of an area. Conversely, a lot of these trees are too long and too flat for the horse's back. And so what you'll have is the bar will sit on the shoulder blade. We'll talk about saddle position in a minute. And it'll sit on the lumbar area and you have a big gap in the middle. And so some of these people are thinking about this is an issue in the, in, with Western saddles. So if we make this area flex, then we won't have the problem with too much pressure at the front and back. Good idea, as long as you haven't just changed your pressure concentration to this small area. So you almost go from one extreme to the other, from bridging mm -hmm. to center pressure. Yes, it is, it is very easy to do. And uh, Ooh, great question. So. Okay. Um, are you going to talk about bar shapes in a in a bit? Um, yes. After after we look at where we need to put this saddle. Okay. Great. Because somebody's asked a question about quarter horse bars, so I figured that. Okay. Okay. Yep. Yep. And we'll have that. Really gets into bar width or or tree width actually. But um, so the deal with putting the saddle on the horse now is that we need to be behind the shoulder blade with our tree. So you can see your tree in here and you can see the shoulder blade. And you see the shape of this tree has a tendency to have a nice rounded, this bar has a nice rounded forward piece. The problem with many, many, many saddles is that this is straight. So when you're looking at the underneath side, and you, you got this one too? Yep. Okay. When you're looking at the underneath side of this, you see this nice little round shape here. On the bar. On the bar. And this is where the horse's shoulder is supposed to be. If this is straight. Ah, I, I see where you're going. It's going to run right into the shoulder blade as it moves back. Or it's going to be sitting on top of the shoulder blade. So the you front of the bar, if it's straight, causes the whole saddle to move back further or sit on the shoulder. Yes, you have two choices and those are the two choices. Okay. And when you move the saddle back, if it's already too long, guess what? This bar now, instead of sitting on the rib cage, because we want the position of this saddle the position of the weight bearing part of this saddle needs to be over the rib cage, not over the lumbar area. So this one will show it even better. There's our last rib. There's our lumbar area. This is the weakest part of the back. So what we want is to have that tree end gently, not sticking into the back muscle. We want a tiny bit of a curve up in the tree. And at the front, we want a nice flare 
outward so that we have room for that shoulder blade to move because we do have a big saddle with a lot of extra leather. And you can see here that your skirting has to come out in front of the tree because ends and the skirting has to get sewn together at the front. So we've added another anywhere from one to two inches to the front of this tree that we now have to make room on the horse's back for. And so somebody's asking by straight, do you mean flat? She's asking about the contour of the horses uh, to match the shape of the horses underneath. But those are two different things, flare and rock. Right? Yes. So the flare is at the front and at the back. So we want it to flare up at the back and we want it to flare out at the front. The amount of rocker in the saddle is the amount of curve that we have following the contour of the horse's back shape. So the rocker is in the middle and the flare is at either end so that we can miss the shoulders and yet have room for that extra two inches of, inch or two inches of leather still missing the shoulder. So it's essentially hanging, if you will, over the shoulder, allowing the shoulder to move. And then we want this nice flare at the back, not as much as my hand, but just, just a little bit of a flare so that the lumbar area is missed. And those skirts are also flared so that they're not curling in and creating a pressure point, right? Right. So what happens is if your saddle has a big skirt back here, or even a small skirt, it still has to miss that lumbar area. So the whole back of the saddle has to actually have a bit of a flare at the back. I should have. Now I'm trying to think of what slide you had with a picture that shows us flare. I do, I do have it. Just have to find it. So what in Western saddles, then we talk about flare, which is the the bar at the front, the rock, which is the curve of the bar, mm -hmm. and the angle, which is what the other question was about. And the angle and the, the spacing apart. Right. The and, the, and that's what really gives us, interestingly enough, in the Western saddle, a lot of our width actually comes from widening out our bar and not changing the angle a huge amount. Ah, okay. People are getting into changing the angle a lot, but traditionally the angle stayed the same and you widened the fork, basically, widened everything to make your quarter horse bar is out here and your narrow gullet is in here. Okay. I haven't, I haven't changed my hands at all. You just and widen the Arabian, little bit, yeah. The Arabian kind of bar actually does change the angle. And, and in English saddles, we really don't talk about rock or flare or bars or um, uh, no. width. No, but we are, we are talking about, we should be talking about it, but we're not. <laughs> right. um, but you have the same issue because you have the angle of the points of your tree. Right. And that does vary a lot more. And the English saddle is all over the map, what they do here. Yep. In the Western saddle, this tends to widen to that. Okay. I'm not changing that. In the English saddle, we can do all these things. And all the way through that tree, we have the angle changing. Right. Being flat towards the back. So here's a saddle on a horse that curves up. And you can, you can see here that you can actually slide your hand underneath the saddle and it will not be touching your knuckles because the back of this flares up and away from the horse's back. There's no pressure on the lumbar area. And, and is that called blocking when they, when they flare the skirts themselves, not the tree, but the, the skirts? 
I, I'm trying to remember what I don't I don't know actually I have to say I'm not not a, a saddle maker and they may they may have a term for that but you because, in order for this to happen you have to actually have the flare on the tree mm -hmm. curving up which is then continued by the leather got it okay if this is straight you could still flare your you could make your leather kind of go up a little bit but it's going to have a tendency to the leather is going to follow the angle of the tree and keep going got it straight or not straight so you should be able to slide your hand all the way up to that first rib without any contact. Done. I don't care how much skirt you put back here. It just can't have the pressure on the lumbar. The shorter skirts do become important if you have a short backed horse. And if you look at where this horse's hip is coming in, if we put a big six inch skirt here, every time that horse moves his hip forward, he's gonna bang into it. So you want the rounded skirt. But the rounded skirt, it's the skirt itself, if it's not contacting the horse, you can put all your saddlebags, you can put all of your trail gear, you can put everything out here. That's not a problem. It's this pressure right in through here. That's the issue. So rule of thumb, I should be able to easily slide my hand between the back of the skirts and the horse's body. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Yep. Um, All the way down. And you don't want to have a tight spot right here is where that hip is, is starting to be encroached upon. This should all be a nice, just slide your hand underneath. And your contact point should be at that first rib. Last rib. La yes, last rib, thank you. <laughs> Anatomy, what's that? Yeah, um, somebody's asking, and, I, and maybe you're gonna talk about this, can you talk about the balance from front to back? Okay, let's, let's finish up that, that gullet width thought for a minute um, that I was doing with my hands up in the air and you can adjust your gullet width which is going to adjust a lot of the width of your saddle so your quarter horse bar your full quarter horse bar is quite spread the angle at least in the traditional sense will be the same but you will have plenty of width to sit down on that wider horse they now make some draft bars that are even wider and some of those are actually going to be angled out a little bit because they are trying to fit some of these massive horses that the original Western saddles weren't designed for. Um, the height of the gullet is the other thing we have to take into consideration because this is hard. There is no padding there. So when, if your saddle comes down close to the withers or you have a horse with high withers, you need a tall gullet. And very few people talk about that, but you can have a saddle made with a tall gullet to miss a horse that has high withers and not have any contact here. But so if you're widening out the bars on a low withered horse, you're okay. But if you're widening out the bars on a high withered horse, you could be in serious trouble. Right. And if the saddle is too wide, if a Western saddle is too wide, this comes, can come right down on that high withered horse. So if we look at, at the way saddle width goes, when you have a saddle that's too wide, that the angle is too wide, it's either too far apart or it's angled too wide, the front of the saddle comes down and all of your pressure goes here. The back flips up. So anybody's saddle whose back is flipping up, the tree is too wide. And that's a, a little bit of an easy thing to see with some of the Western saddles because you'll just see the back of it bobbing around as you're, as you're moving. All of your pressure ends up here. Your weight is in your stirrup bar here, but it is going to end up 
on the base of the fork. And that is also going to put even more pressure on the shoulder blade or your other choice is your saddle is actually gonna slide out backwards. And your pads are the first indicator of migration. Yes, your pads will tend to wanna to migrate out the back. You, you are going to be tipping forward. And so to save your hide, you're going to stick your feet out in front of you so you don't fall off. So a lot of people own a quarter horse and you think you need quarter horse bars, right? Because I have a quarter horse. So remember the quarter horse bars are gonna be wider. Most of the quarter horses I see and both in the East and the West have got a lot of thoroughbred in them these days. Yeah. Guess what? They ain't wide they, many of them can be on the narrower side. So you put your quarter horse bar on your quarter horse that is moderate in width and has a set of withers. And the next thing you know, not only are you putting all your pressure right in here, but you're banging the top of their withers with the center of your fork. So the other thing that happens and when we're looking at kind of saddle position and tree width, we need to be able to have our, set, or our Western saddle with its curve here and its extra piece of leather, we need space at this shoulder blade. If we move it behind the shoulder blade, which is we need all of our pressure behind the shoulder blade, but like I said, I don't care how much saddle is in front as long as it's not touching. So if we have to move our saddle back to prevent it from touching the shoulder, what ends up happening with this long bar is suddenly it's ending halfway down the lumbar area, halfway up that croup, or even almost to the sacroiliac on these smaller horses. That's not where we need our pressure. And then we as humans end up sitting, instead of in the center of the horse's back, we end up sitting over the last few ribs and on the lumbar area, which is the weakest part of the horse. And it puts us completely out of balance with them. So let's see, there's a little bit of, oh, I was talking about shims. That's, we're not ready for shims yet. No, that's another webinar. That's, that's another webinar, yeah. yeah. Um, so these are the these are our three big areas for fitting the tree is we've got to have some flare up here at the shoulder we've got to have nice even contact here in the middle and we have to have contact that leaves at the last rib those are and you can slide your hand take your take your rings off slide your hand up underneath all the way underneath this fork. So you have to slide your arm up underneath all of this leather and get it up here and feel where the pressure is and slide it all the way back under the bar, not out here under the leather, but under the bar, all the way to the back and see where it leaves there, the horse's back. And ideally, and, you would do that with the back slightly lifted. Into ideally, you'll do it with the back slightly lifted. You, what you do want to feel, though, is you want to feel the, some, what some of those pressures are, even without the back lifted. Because what happens a lot of times, if you have tremendous pressure here, light pressure here, and tremendous pressure here, when you sit on the horse, they are not bringing their back up. Right. They're going to stay drop down and you're going to keep your bridge in the middle because this is, this is too painful for them to come up into. So, so check so that would be, as they stand. Like if you had a really, uh, a, a tree that was a really flat, straight, very little contour bar on a short little backed Arab, 
you'd wind up with that point pressure at the shoulders and probably into the point of the hip and mm -hmm. then a big gap in the middle. And so the horse will never yeah. bring his back up. Right. They can't. They just can't. Right. And there are times that you can play cards with somebody on the other side. Wow. If somebody else was putting their hands, you can shake hands almost. There's such a gap in many of these saddles. Is, and the, that is horse, the primary issue that the trees are too long in most Western saddles? Yes. They're okay. too long and too flat. Okay. And so if your tree has a nice rocker in it, then you can follow the contour of the horse's back and you will automatically have these flares at the front and the back. And so you can get away with a little bit longer tree. And some of the companies that make sort of an Arabian saddle, the Arabs tend to have a fairly short back. And so some of the companies are making an Arabian tree that is shorter. And some of them, because a lot of the Arabs have the higher croup, as do many of the quarter horses, but don't tell the saddle makers that because they don't seem to believe it. They all have this croup that goes up. The Arabian people have made the saddle a little bit shorter and some of them will have a little bit more of a flare at the back. Quarter horse people don't seem to have gotten that. Um, so, but a so lot of the someone, quarter horses sorry. go way up. Someone's asking when going from a 14 inch to a 17 inch Western saddle, do they just make the whole tree longer or are the angles changed as well? Wider gullet, spinal clearance, like what do they do when they make it from 14 to 17? Mainly moving, mainly they're moving the cantle back. Now, if they're going from 14 to 17, they are probably also adding an inch or two to the tree itself. And so your entire saddle is going to be larger, longer. But for and the that, most part, they're just moving the cantle mm -hmm, farther back. And then we haven't talked about ground seats, but I, I might be getting ahead of you. <laughs> um, the, the ground seats, where do I have a picture? ground seats. I should. As you can see, folks, this is quite a large topic. <laughs> oh, you can, I mean, you know, we have spent, what, three days, four days doing clinics, just going through all of this. Right. Um, yeah, we used to do um, the saddle fit clinics and Joyce would do a day of lecture, a day of teaching people how to pre-vet their saddles in a day of fittings. We haven't done that in a while. No. So this, this picture will probably, we can talk about the ground seat because the ground seat is really nothing more than, if you remember back to the picture of the tree, there's a big, huge, wide gullet down the middle. And that the one thing that's good about the Western saddles is they all have that nice wide gullet. Um, the English saddles, we can lose our gullets totally on just because of bad design. But the Western tree then has, so that you as the rider don't have your crotch hanging through the four inch gullet, they put a seat on that. And that seat is hard, made out of metal um, in many cases. So if that seat is too flat or angled incorrectly, that seat is going to put the rider in different places. And if the ground seat is too flat, then you're actually gonna have a pressure point on the horse if you have high withers right where my... Um, Can you make that picture bigger? Yes. Oh, awesome. So, um, so if your ground seat is flat and the, some of the cutting saddles, they do that because they don't wanna be interrupted by any saddle then make the ground seat really flat and you'll end up with a pressure point way back here. And you kind of wonder where that's coming from. And it's coming from the back of your ground seat if you have a high withered horse. Conversely, if you make your ground seat with a big hump in the middle, it will force you to sit at the back and you will not have any choice. There'll be no way you can sit in the middle of the saddle, which is where your balance point should be. So the way that the seat is made dictates a lot of how you can sit in the saddle. And that's 
applied on top of the tree. So it's totally at the whim of the saddle maker. Yes. So what happens when you put it all together and you put the rider into it is that you, you can see now our piece of leather on the saddle and the ground seat is under that holding it up. Otherwise it wouldn't stay there. And this ground seat can be large, which is going to make you sit on the back of the cantle. It can be really flat, which will let, allow you to sit in the, in the saddle nicely. And it can also, and should have a little bit of a curve at the front. You don't, you do not need to sit up here. No. It will not work very well because your legs are gonna get in the way of the fork and the swells. So this area up here can have a little bit of a, of a rise to it to clear the withers. And then you should be allowed to sit comfortably in the center of the seat and drop your legs straight down. And if you can do that, then you are riding in a balanced position. So you can go do a dressage test, you can go do a trail ride, you can go do a whatever you want to do because you're in balance. What happens a lot of times though is that this, this is our, remember our little groove in the saddle, in the, in the tree at the beginning? This is our stirrup leather going across the tree and it's nice and wide. So if this is placed too far forward in the overall construction or your seat is forced to be in the back here, then you spend your days reaching forward to try and find a place to rest your foot because the stirrup is dragging you forward with every step of the way. And so we can see usually. So oh, so, somebody's asking a question that I, I, I'm gonna answer here. So somebody says, can you add a seat to the top if it doesn't fit the rider well? Prosthetic ground seat. Should rider have three point contact like in English? Okay, so when I teach anybody in a Western saddle, there are three things I almost standard do. And this is a great picture to talk about this um, <laughs> because when you, when, the saddle is made, the leather hangs parallel to the horse's body. But because of the width of the leather for the Western stirrup, it, it is so wide that when you twist it so that the stirrup is perpendicular as just point, draw a little circle around that stirrup, what you can see is how angled that stirrup is. And that's a physics problem. It happens when you twist a flat plane and it's, it's gonna happen to any, anything wide that is then twisted perpendicular. The inside edge is lower than the outside edge. That's gonna cause the rider to either brace and push their feet out or roll to the outside edge of their foot and try to weight bear on their pinky toe. Both are bad solutions. So um, the solution I came up with many years ago with the help of a Western saddle maker is putting a shim with the wider part of the shim toward the horse so that you basically are making a level surface for that rider's foot to rest on instead of an angled surface. And that alleviate, I alleviate more knee pain with a $20 pair of shims than anything else I do for Western people. Um, so that's one thing. The second thing is that typically, as you can see here, the rider's leg swings forward because of the angle of the way the leather is put into the tree. It forces the rider to push the feet forward. Leveling the stirrup certainly helps a ton on that, but sometimes you need additional help, basically tying the stirrups back so they can't swing forward so you're not bracing against them. And then this issue of the ground seat. One of the, uh, we have worked on a prosthetic ground seat. Um, I have prototypes. Um, if you're wondering if your ground seat's too wide and causing you to push your leg forward, the quickest and easiest way to figure it out is get a pair of Franklin balls, which are air filled balls, stick them underneath your seat bones. It's gonna raise you up away from the saddle to alleviate the hips being kicked out sideways, which they can only go so far. Um, so when you can't straddle wide, that's when you push your feet forward. Sitting on a pair of Franklin balls is a great way to find out if your ground seat's too wide. Solving a too wide ground seat is a whole nother that I could do a whole webinar on that. Um, not an easy thing for a permanent solution. I'm working on it. 
Um, but yes, the idea of a prosthetic ground seat is a good idea because most ground seats are not built up enough for the rider's pelvis. They're flat. And so you get pressure. Yep. Yeah, at the neck of the femur. So, so if this is my hip joint, here, I'll do it right there. There's my hip joint. Here's my neck of my femur. Here's my greater trochanter. Here's my thigh. I can have pressure from the saddle at the joint, at the neck, and at the top of the femur, three places kicking my leg out. And the only solution is to take my feet forward to solve it. Um, by raising the rider up, you can start to determine if that's a problem. I hope that helps. That, yeah, and that's that's um, that's really key with a lot of the Western saddles and, and the ground seats are just not made. For, I don't know who they're made for, but I don't know. Not, not for us humans. <laughs> well, the um, weird thing is in the English world, they say that a woman needs a wide ground seat and a man needs a narrow one. And in the Western world, all these guys are riding in wide ground seats and the women can't ride in them. So I'm confused. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there's, there's a few anatomical uh, discrepancies here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the bottom line is that if, if you're going to sit on a barrel or you're going to put a little kid on a tiny pony, it, it's the same sort of thing. You, you, you can easily visualize what that does to your hip. And you take the little kid on the tiny fat pony and their legs stick straight out to the side. And there is no, you have no no ability to use your legs. And the same thing will happen with the treeless saddles. If you're on too wide of a horse with a treeless saddle, you have the same issue. One possible thing to help that is to make yourself a, using a seat saver, putting some foam or something firm up down the, sort of down the center line of the saddle, which will give you, raise you up a little bit. But being able to do some something more, more permanent, less that doesn't move around as much yeah. would be a great idea. So keep right. working on that way. The shift, the shifting around. If you're just going to be going down the trail, using a seat saver with foam will work. But if you're going to do any kind of activity, that's not going to work because it'll. I've yet to be able to find a way to stabilize it enough. Right. It, it'll definitely shift. Yeah. Um, and some of the treeless saddle companies are coming up with these little plastic trees. Guess what? <laughs> we need some kind of structure up underneath our, um, our crotch area. And the more padding that we have on the insides of our legs, the worse the problem is because it pushes your hips out. So I had, my mare was a Connemara and tended to be very wide. And so riding in a treeless saddle one day, I could not canter. There was no way, shape or form where she was gonna have me on the ground because there was no way I have well endowed on the inside of my leg thighs. And there was no way that I could get my leg down on the side of her and she knew that. Mm -hmm. And she knew I had no use of my lower leg. And I felt, totally unbalanced and she felt totally unbalanced. Um, and that was just essentially the same issue as the width of the ground seat. Mm -hmm. yeah. In the hard, big Western saddle, it's really easy for us to kind of fake it. We just lean back against the, the cantle. We brace our feet like this. Um, and, and we think we're okay because we're not falling off but we're not okay and the horses are really not okay. And we are ending up with knee and hip pain for ourselves yep. and the horses are ending up with back pain and bad performance issues and all kinds of stuff like that. Um, and in terms of a three-point seat, a three-point seat is only a three-point seat if the saddle is kind. In other words, <laughs> you've got to sit with your seat bones pointing straight down and if you have to anterior tilt or tilt your pelvis forward to have the pubic bone in contact, then your saddle is not meeting you properly for a three-point seat. In other words, you should not have to alter the, the balanced position of the pelvis to have contact with the pubic bone. And if you could wind up with some serious problems, either if you're getting hit too hard in the pubic bone, um, I'm talking about English saddle. I still remember the saddle that bit me so bad I couldn't walk for two days. Um, yeah, I had one of those too. 
Yeah. <laughs> um, and in a Western saddle, if that ground seat is not built so that you have your two seat bones and then just kindly meets your pubic bone, it'll be painful. And it, you know, it, you're not trying to force yourself into a three point position. The saddle should allow you to be in a comfortable three point position. And I think there's a lot of misunderstanding on that. Um, Yes. And it's, it's that allow mm. it happens and you don't have to think about it yep. if it's right. You can um, just be there. Someone's asking, how can you tell if the tree is too narrow? So if the tree is too narrow, so um, if the tree is correct, what you're going to have is over here on this left side of my screen, I guess it's the left side of your screen too. Yes. Um, what you're going to have is that your bars parallel your horse's back. It's not, it's, it's a nice even, when you put your hand underneath, Everything is smooth, even contact from front to back, approximately the same amount of weight all the way through. When you have a tree that's too wide, then what you have is too much of this. It leaves you with pressure at the top and no pressure at the bottom. Of, where, of the fork or your leather. So it's essentially floating here and your pressure is at the top here. So this is where you'll see these Western saddles, they flip up at the back and you tend to see white spots up here at the front. When it's too narrow, then what you're going to see is the tightness is at the bottom of the tree now, because I'm exaggerating, but the points of the tree, instead of following the contour of the horse's back, the points of the tree are now, the, or the, the base of the fork is now poking in at the bottom. So our tight spot is down here. So this is what the sorts of things that you're going to be feeling as you slide your hand underneath. And you'll have the same thing. This is, this is going through. This is be in the middle of the saddle. Nice, even contact. The bars are too wide. So you have your quarter horse bar on your small little animal, whether it's a quarter horse or not. It's too wide. It will also be too wide in the middle and it will be too wide at the back. You won't have any contact at the, at the outer edge of your tree. I'm not worried about the leather. I'm worried about the tree itself. When it's too narrow, you have the contact at the outer edges. And sometimes you'll put your hand in and all you feel is pressure right on this outer edge. And you don't feel any contact on the rest of your hand. On this one, in the too wide scenario, you put your hand in and you feel no contact on the outer edge, this one, and you feel all the contact up by the horse's spine. So that's one way of looking at the tree fit. And the other way will be our, I don't know if I have one that's too narrow here. Is what's going to happen, basically, looking at it from the side, we had our, our scenario where it was too wide and it was flipping up at the back. The too narrow is going to be sitting high at the front and dumping you at an angle towards the back. That and draft horse saddle looked like it might have been sitting up in front. Yes. Yes, you can, you can see really, if you look at this line, that it looks like the whole thing is going down towards the back. And that all of that's contributing towards her being forced to put her feet out in front of her. Yeah, plus and then the breastplate's just holding the saddle right against the shoulder blade. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, yeah we, we could do a lot. We could lot go on with this one for a while, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, somebody's, somebody's saying that they've always been taught to fit the saddle without the pad first. Is this correct? Yes, in a Western saddle, you want to do that because the Western saddle requires a relatively thick pad because you are looking at the bar and a layer of sheepskin and that's it. So it is designed, in the English saddle, we have a panel underneath it, but we also wanna look at it without a pad. With the Western saddle, we want to look at it without a pad because once we put the pad on, we can't feel anything through it. We can't see anything through it. We need to see where the pressure points are. The saddle is designed to add, ideally, most of the time, about a one inch thick pad and wool felt is the absolute best. Um, it, and it will cover a multitude of sins, not everything, but it, it is the most forgiving thing to put underneath a horse's uh, Western saddle. If your saddle is tending to be a little bit on the narrow side, or you have a really round horse, you probably don't want a whole one inch pad because you don't need that much extra. But in general, it is made for that. So if the saddle is fitting without the pad, it is still going to fit with the pad. If you have pressure points without the pad, you will have pressure points with the pad. The only question is how fast do they get through the pad? And that's where the wool felt will actually absorb a little bit of that for a while. Once you can see the shape of those pressure points on the horse side of the saddle pad, it becomes a cat bed or a dog bed. And it is no longer doing its, its job of, of trying to protect the horse's back because that pressure point has worked its way through the material. Do you have a picture of a well-fitting Western saddle with a rider on? Um, yeah, and lots of them in the book. Um, yeah. I don't know. I'm just about... like, we've been staring at this woman for a little while. I don't want to leave Can people we... with that impression. Okay. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yes, we do. Yes. Oh, good. Oh, well, that's in his English saddle. That's in my dress oh, saddle. <laughs> so, so what we've done with this is take a, let me um, do this properly this time. What, what we did with this was to take somebody who is an excellent rider and, and the actual purpose of this was to show that it's all about what the saddle allows you to do and, and what you can do to mess everything up or what the saddle can do to mess everything up. So here we have a Western sport being done in an English saddle, but the English saddle allows the rider to be in the right position. And you can see the difference in the quality of this horse's stop riding correctly. It doesn't matter what the saddle looks like. He's riding correctly and the horse is responding by doing a beautiful sliding stop. The minute you put him in the back seat, put his legs out in front of him, which is what people are made to do by their saddles. And then he just added to it a little bit by riding like a lot of the people do. Um, suddenly the horse's back is stiff. The sliding stop is, is, is nowhere near what we have here when we have somebody riding correctly. I can't remember if I have him. I don't think I have in this a picture of him in a Western saddle riding well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't think in this particular. No, if I got one handy. I could see. I have. Um... Oh, I might. Okay. Hang on. But here, actually, you can see where the, the saddle, let me, I have two. Let me see what this one looks like. Um, all right, uh, I'm gonna just share my screen here and put this picture up. 
so and there he's yeah. balanced and again you have you have the 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 complete use of the horse's back yep and and you can see where this saddle is um starting to pitch up at the back mm -hmm. a little bit well now in this particular scenario, this horse is tucking his butt down so far, the saddle has to be up. Oh, true. So, so the rider though is able to stay totally balanced, even though the saddle could be a little bigger for him with his long legs, the saddle is allowing him to be balanced and he is staying balanced. The horse is doing his thing underneath it and is actually using his back. And, and curling that whole lumbar area away from the saddle. The saddle is staying perfectly in balance. Yep. Yeah, you're right. Um, and note that he does not have his feet pushed forward for that stop, so he's not bracing against his horse. Right. And again, the, the, the stop is just as pretty as the stop with the English saddle where he's in balance. Yep. Cool. We have a couple of other motion things here. Let me just do. Um, I'm going to take this. And just looking at a couple of different, different scenarios of being in balance in different, in different sports um, and different types of saddles. And you can stay in balance when the saddle allows you to. And when the horse is comfortable, the horse will then perform in balance. And, and, and then it becomes, everybody's comfortable. Everybody's happy. So we could go and we could get into all the nuances and the details, but I think we've I think it's almost gone for two hours. Yeah. So uh, I, I think this is a good place to stop. That's a lot of information for people to kind of yeah. consider. Um, um, to think about and to go back and watch again. And of course, you've got your pain free back and saddle fit book, which is available as ebook and your DVD is streaming now at Trafalgar Square, right? Yep. 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 Um, and of course, the DVD does not have as much information as the book. You just can't put the whole book on a DVD. Deb, you've got your hand raised. Did you want to ask something maybe in the chat? She hasn't said anything. Okay. Yeah. Oh, she unraised. Oh, oh. <laughs> thanks, Rhonda. Rhonda, Rhonda's another one of my regulars. All right, folks. So thank you so much for joining us tonight. This is, um, you know, a topic that is, it's really important to make sure that you check your saddle fit. Um, oh, you had no phone issues. Okay. Um, and we really appreciate you spending the time with us tonight. And thank you, Joyce. It's always such a pleasure to have you. You're, you know, such a wealth of knowledge and information that you're so kind to share with all my audience. Thank you so much. I'm glad to be here, glad to share and go out and check your saddles and uh, find things that work and pay it just pay attention to what your horse is telling you. Yep. Yep. It'll make the ride better for everybody. Yes. More fun. Yep. That's the idea. It's fun. Yeah. Yep. All right. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time. Have a great night. Take Bye. Care. Bye, Joyce.